Welcome back everyone, ready for another deep dive? Today we're going way back ancient Greece to explore the ideas of this philosopher named Anaxagoras. Talk about a guy who wasn't afraid to shake things up a bit. What's amazing is how relevant his ideas still feel today. Even after all these centuries, we're still wrestling with those fundamental questions about the universe, you know? Like, what is everything actually made of? What got the ball rolling? Big stuff. It's humbling, right, to think someone from 2,000 years ago could still have so much to teach us. So to really get into Anaxagoras, we got to set the scene. Imagine ancient Athens, the golden age, a time of incredible intellectual energy. What was it about that period that allowed these groundbreaking ideas to flourish? It was a huge turning point. You see, before this, myths and legends, that was the go-to for explaining how the world worked. But in ancient Greece, there was this shift towards reason, towards looking at the world and trying to figure it out through observation. And that's where Anaxagoras comes in. Exactly. He was right there on the front lines of this intellectual revolution, questioning those old stories and trying to find more well, rational explanations for the universe. Mm. He wasn't afraid to push the boundaries, that's for sure. And push he did. I mean, just take his idea about the sun. He claimed it wasn't a god, but this giant red-hot stone, even bigger than, like, the entire Peloponnese region of Greece. Can you imagine the reaction back then? Oh, I, I bet that ruffled some feathers. Accusing someone of disrespecting the gods, that was serious business. Right, like life or death serious. Exactly. And for Anaxagoras, that's actually what got him exiled from Athens. It goes to show how revolutionary and risky new ideas could be back then. It's a good reminder that the search for knowledge has always come with a price, huh? But it seems like, for Anaxagoras, the truth was worth the risk. So, let's dive into some of those groundbreaking ideas, shall we? One of the biggest questions philosophers were grappling with back then was, what is the universe made of? It seems so basic now, but... <laughs> Right. Try to imagine a world without the periodic table, without even the concept of atoms. They were starting from scratch. So how do they even begin to answer that question about what's the universe made of? What were some of the theories floating around back then? Well, some philosophers, like Parmenides, believed that everything was made of this single, unchanging substance. And you had others, like Empedocles, who said, Nope, there are four basic elements. Earth, air, fire, and water. Sounds kind of familiar, right? It does. It's fascinating how those ancient ideas still pop up, even if we understand things a bit differently now. But Anaxagoras, he wasn't satisfied with just one or four elements. He went all out, didn't he? Oh, he went all out, all right. Anaxagoras, he comes along and says, what if there are infinite ingredients? Infinite seeds, as he called them. Infinite seeds? Okay, so not just like earth, air, fire, and water. Nope. He's talking flesh, bone, hair. You name it. Even Bark made it onto his list. Bark? That's a new one. What on earth led him to that idea? It's a wild rap. <laughs> but get this. Anaxagoras, he asked this question, and I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but he basically said, how can you get flesh from something that isn't already flesh? Like, it's got to come from somewhere. Hmm. So he's kind of hinting at this idea of, like, matter can't be created or destroyed, just transformed. Exactly. He's basically touching on the conservation of matter centuries before modern science. Pretty mind-blowing, huh? Seriously. Way ahead of his time. But okay, infinite ingredients, that sounds pretty chaotic. How did he account for any kind of order in the universe? All right, so this is where things get really interesting. And Exagoras introduces this concept of nous, N-O-U-S. It's Greek for, like, mind or intelligence. And he believed that nous acted as this organizing force bringing order to all those infinite seeds. So like a cosmic conductor orchestrating everything. Like that. He imagined this swirling vortex where similar ingredients were drawn together. Like imagine bits of earth clumping together to form land, fiery elements becoming stars, that sort of thing. A cosmic dance of ingredients. Exactly. That was his first stage of cosmic organization. Mm. But then there's stage two life. Okay, so how did life emerge from all this? In Exagoras, he believed that the seeds of life they were already present in that swirling mix. But it was the inherent power of news within them that allowed them to develop, to become plants, animals, eventually us. So news didn't just create the universe, it breathes life into it. You got it. And Exagoras saw it as both the architect and the animating force of the cosmos. It's a pretty wild idea when you think about it, this mind shaping the universe and kickstarting life as we know it. It's like, even back then, they were grappling with some of the same big questions we're still trying to answer today. Absolutely. And Exagoras might not have had access to, like, 
telescopes or microscopes, but he was definitely onto something with this idea of an organizing principle. It's like a blueprint guiding the universe. Right, like we've got the Big Bang, evolution, these grand theories about how things work. Exactly. And you know, like any true pioneer, not everyone was on board with Anaxagoras' ideas. Even some of his biggest fans, like Plato and Aristotle, they had some bones to pick with his concept of nus. Oh, really? I figured the infinite ingredients thing would be the toughest sell. You'd think, right. But it was actually the whole, how does nus work thing that tripped them up. Okay, so what didn't they like? See, in Exagoras, he believed that nus got the universe spinning, but then kind of stepped back. It was like setting a clock in motion and letting it run. A hands-off approach to universe creation. Exactly. But Plato and Aristotle, they thought, hold on, a true intelligence, a mind. It wouldn't just act randomly. There's got to be a reason, a goal behind all this. So it's like that classic debate, is the universe just a giant machine? Or is there some kind of purpose, some intelligence behind it all? Exactly. And that debate is still raging today, isn't it? I mean, think about artificial intelligence. Can we really create a true thinking machine if we don't program it with some sense of purpose, of right and wrong? It's incredible how these questions have echoed through time, and Anaxagoras was right there at the beginning, sparking the conversation. He really was. And even though his ideas were controversial, even dangerous back then, he wasn't afraid to put them out there. So when it comes to Anaxagoras and his legacy, what would you say is his biggest contribution? Hmm. Well, he definitely wasn't afraid to challenge the status quo. He forced people to think differently. But I think his most enduring contribution was planting that seed the idea that mind, in some form, might just be the driving force behind it all. And that's an incredibly powerful idea. It makes you look at yourself, at the universe, in a whole new light. And on that note, that's all the time we have for today's deep dive into the mind of Anaxagoras. From the bustling streets of ancient Athens to the swirling vortex of the cosmos, we've explored ideas that continue to shape our understanding of the universe and our place within it. Until next time, Keep those minds curious. In this grind called life, we hold our heads high. Through the stormy skies, we never say die. Facing every challenge like a stoic knight. With every step forward, we ignite the night. Bounce back from the falls, never showing no fear. In the darkest moments, our minds stay clear. With a heart of iron and a steady aim, we charge through the pain, never seeking fame. Keep it moving, keep it strong Push it forward all day long Stoic courage, battle on Raise your voice and sing this song From the valleys low to the highest peaks We conquer the silence even when it speaks Life's battles rage on, we never shy away Standing firm in the fray each and every day Rhythm of resilience pounding in our chest Fighting every battle, never taking rest Stoic courage flowing in our veins Through the joy and through the pains Keep it moving, keep it strong Push it forward all day long Stoic courage battle on Raise your voice and sing this song Back from the falls, never showing no fear In the darkest moments, our minds stay clear With a heart of iron and a steady aim We charge through the pain, never seeking fame Keep it moving, keep it strong Push it forward all day long Stoic courage, battle on Raise your voice and sing this song Keep it moving, keep it strong Forward all day long Stoic courage battle on Raise your voice and sing this song Or concept it can never be satisfied to going back to where it was. So some of you are going to experience a breakthrough. Some of you are going to go back and look at your dreams and brush them off. Some of you are going to begin to look at yourself and say, hey, look here, I know I have not done all that I can do. When Buster Douglas was fighting with Mike Tyson and the odd makers predicted he was a bum and be out, he'd be knocked out in about one or two rounds. I think that after he made it to the third round, he took some of Mike Tyson's best shots. He said, wait, wait a minute. Hey, Mike, you know, 
It's possible that maybe this next call might do. It's possible this next job interview might be the one. It's possible. In spite of 27 rejections, it's possible that this might be the one. It's possible. Just maybe I can do this. That's, that's all. That, that puts you on the playing field. You ain't got to hype yourself and psych yourself out. What it does is just keep you moving in that direction. That's all I'm asking you. Believe that it's possible that you can make it. I like what Charles Allen said. He said, when you say a situation, a person is hopeless, you're slamming the door in the face of God. You're slamming the door in the face of God. There's no guarantee that because somebody is now down on their luck, they can never come back. Who can guarantee that you can't make it? That you can't have your dream? Who can guarantee that you can't do what you want to do? No one can do that. No one can predict that. You can't even do that. You don't know what the possibilities are for your life. No, no, no. All we need to do is we look at our dreams. As we get ready to hit the floor, I am blessed and highly favored. And it's possible I can get my dream. You go after that dream too. Don't go casually. You got to go out there like you want that dream. Don't, don't go out here like these people. See, when you feel like you're blessed, you're ready to get into a good fight for this dream. You're ready to get down for this dream. You want your dream? Then you say, I want this dream if it's convenient, if I don't have any hassle, if I don't have to flip through any hoop. Give a person everything that he desires. And at the same moment, he will feel that this is not everything. The only constant in life is change. Embrace it, and you'll grow. I am a firm believer in the people. If given the truth, they can be depended upon to meet any national crisis. The great point is to bring them the real facts. Abraham Lincoln At 20 years of age, the will reigns, at 30, the wit, and at 40, the judgment. Being human means having doubts and yet still continuing on your path. Success in life is the result of good judgment. Good judgment is usually the result of experience. Experience is usually the result of bad judgment. Brian Tracy Against those who lament over being pitied I am grieved, a man says, at being pitied Whether then is the fact of your being pitied a thing which concerns you or those who pity you? Well, is it in your power to stop this pity? It is in my power if I show them that I do not require pity. And whether then are you in the condition of not deserving pity, or are you not in that condition? I think I am not. But these persons do not pity me for the things for which if they ought to pity me it would be proper, I mean for my faults. But they pity me for my poverty, for not possessing honorable offices, for diseases and deaths, and other such things. Whether then are you prepared to convince the many that not one of these things is an evil, but that it is possible for a man who is poor and has no office and enjoys no honor to be happy, or to show yourself to them as rich and in power? For the second of these things belong to a man who is boastful, silly, and good for nothing, and consider by what means the pretense must be supported. It will be necessary for you to hire slaves and to possess a few silver vessels, and to exhibit them in public if it is possible, though they are often the same, and to attempt to conceal the fact that they are the same, and to have splendid garments, and all other things for display, and to show that you are a man honored by the great, and to try to sup at their houses, or to be supposed to sup there, and as to your person to employ some mean arts, that you may appear to be more handsome and nobler than you are. These things you must contrive if you choose to go by the second path in order not to be pitied. But the first way is both impracticable and long, to attempt the very thing which Zeus has not been able to do, 
to convince all men what things are good and bad. Is this power given to you? This only is given to you to convince yourself, and you have not convinced yourself. Then I ask you, do you attempt to persuade other men, and who has lived so long with you as you with yourself, and who has so much power of convincing you as you have of convincing yourself, and who is better disposed and nearer to you than you are to yourself? How then, have you not convinced yourself in order to learn? At present are not things upside down? Is this what you have been earnest about doing? To learn to be free from grief and free from disturbance, and not to be humbled, and to be free? Have you not heard then, that there is only one way which leads to this end, to give up the things which do not depend on the will, to withdraw from them, and to admit that they belong to others? For another man then to have an opinion about you, of what kind is it? It is a thing independent of the will. Then is it nothing to you? It is nothing. When then you are still vexed at this and disturbed, do you think that you are convinced about good and evil? Will you not then, letting others alone, be to yourself both scholar and teacher? The rest of mankind will look after this, whether it is to their interest to be and to pass their lives in a state contrary to nature. But to me no man is nearer than myself. What then is the meaning of this, that I have listened to the words of the philosophers and I assent to them? But in fact I am no way made easier. Am I so stupid? And yet, in all other things such as I have chosen, I have not been found very stupid. But I learned letters quickly, and to wrestle, and geometry, and to resolve syllogisms. Has not then reason convinced me? And indeed no other things have I from the beginning so approved and chosen. And now I read about these things, hear about them, write about them. I have so far discovered no reason stronger than this. In what then am I deficient? Have the contrary opinions not been eradicated from me? Have the notions themselves not been exercised nor used to be applied to action, but as armor are laid aside and rusted and cannot fit me? And yet neither in the exercises of the palaestra, nor in writing or reading am I satisfied with learning. But I turn up and down the syllogisms which are proposed, and I make others, and sophistical syllogisms also, but the necessary theorems, by proceeding from which a man can become free from grief, fear, passions, hindrance, and a free man, these I do not exercise myself in, nor do I practice in these the proper practice. Then I care about what others will say of me, whether I shall appear to them worth notice, whether I shall appear happy. Wretched man, will you not see what you are saying about yourself? What do you appear to yourself to be? In your opinions, in your desires, in your aversions from things, in your movements, in your preparation, in your designs and in other acts suitable to a man. But do you trouble yourself about this, whether others pity you? Yes, but I am pitied not as I ought to be. Are you then pained at this? And is he who is pained an object of pity? Yes. How then are you pitied not as you ought to be? Everybody wants the future, but nobody wants to accept their current reality. See, truth is not what you want it to be. It is what it is, and you must bend to its power or live a lie. See, so many people keep telling themselves it didn't happen, but it did, and it hurts you.